Welcome. I'm uh, Michael Burdash. I teach uh, Japanese literature here in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about rethinking post-war Japanese culture as Cold War culture, the remarkable life and times of Juji George Kasai, uh, class of 1913. Um, some of you may know that the very first PhD awarded by the University of Chicago to anybody uh, went to a man named Asada Eiji in 1893, uh, who was actually a Japanese citizen. He was a, a friend of President Harper's who came to the university and received the very first uh, doctorate awarded by the University of Chicago back in 1893. Uh, to commemorate uh, him, the Center for East Asian Studies every year offers the Asada Eiji Prize to the best BA thesis, uh, graduation thesis, uh, devoted to the, some topic dealing with East Asia. Um, and I just actually this week discovered uh, another very early uh, Japan connection. There was a man named Watase Shosabudo who was a cellular biologist who taught on the faculty at the University of Chicago in the 1890s. Uh, for a few years. Um, but today I'm going to talk about another very early graduate of the University from Japan, uh, a man named uh, Kasai Juji in Japanese, or as he preferred to be called in English, George Kasai, uh, who graduated in 1913 from the University and went on to a really remarkable career as an author, a diplomat, a politician, uh, and a public intellectual. And I'm going to try, as, as I tell you a little bit about Kasai, I'm going to connect him to my own current work. Uh, I discovered him as part of a project that I'm undertaking, thinking about Japanese culture during the Cold War. Uh, I came into this project thinking about what the Cold War means uh, for Japan, what Japan means for the Cold War. I think that there's a commonsensical notion that what we call the Cold War was primarily something that happened in Europe. Uh, in the confrontation between NATO and the Warsaw Pact uh, powers, that the Berlin Wall was the real front line in, in the Cold War, and that Asia, while involved in the Cold War, was kind of a secondary theater. And within that secondary theater of, of Asia, Japan in particular was, was a peripheral presence, so that in, in common sense or in the common view of the period, Japan was more a bystander than a participant in the Cold War. And I, I, this common sense notion, I've, I've come to think, is, is, is untenable. Uh, I, I've, I've increasingly come to think that you can't really understand the Cold War unless you think about Japan's role in it. And uh, conversely, you also can't really understand Japan since 1945 without really thinking about what the Cold War was. Um, and, and as I started pursuing this project, I started teaching a class at the University of Chicago uh, on uh, Japanese literature and culture in, in, in the Cold War. And the class started out as a thought experiment. I took a syllabus that I had been teaching with the title Post-War Japanese Culture, and I changed the title. I called it Cold War Japanese Culture, but I didn't change anything else. On purpose, I wanted to force myself to take the same writers that I'd always thought of as, as post-war writers and think of them as Cold War writers, and, and see what happens when you take a novelist like Mishima or a film director like Ozu or Kurosawa and think of them as Cold War figures. Uh, how does our, our um, perception of who they were, what they were doing, change? Um, and, and I'm finding that post-war Japanese culture looks very different when you think about it as being Cold War culture, and that the Cold War too starts to look like a very different entity when you start thinking about Japan as being at the center of it. I always start the class off with a series of questions for the students, and I thought I would do the same thing here today. Just thinking about what is our basic wisdom about the Cold War. Um, there are no right or wrong answers to these questions. The Cold War, as a historical event, is more like the Industrial Revolution than the French Revolution. Um, we don't really know when it began. We don't really know when it ended. We, you know, different historians will have different perceptions on this. Um, but these are the questions that I, that I ask the students. The first one is, what was the Cold War fought over? What was at stake in the Cold War? What, how would you answer that question? Does anyone have an answer? I mean, just in general terms, what was the Cold War fought over? Global influence, other uh, global power. Um, another question I often get is, what, which ideological system is going to be dominant in, in the world. I think th these are all what we think about the Cold War, um, and certainly what I thought about the Cold War. Um, but when we recenter 
our focus on East Asia and on Japan in particular and ask the question again, what was the Cold War being fought over? And we look at the places in Asia where the Cold War f really flared up, places like Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, and we ask what these places have in common. What they have in common is that on August 15, 1945, they were all parts of the Japanese Empire. Uh, and so when we recenter our vision of the Cold War on Japan, it starts to look like what the Cold War was fighting over was who was going to control the territory that used to be the Japanese Empire. It looks like a war to, f to, to, to control uh, an empire that's broken up. What made the Cold War cold? Why do we call it a Cold War? Yeah, it, it was an ideological struggle, a, a cultural struggle, uh, a war of words and ideas uh, rather than an arms struggle. Um, but again, when we look at East Asia and we look at things like the Chinese Revolution, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, suddenly the Cold War doesn't look so cold anymore. The Cold War looks a lot more like a hot war uh, when we, we center it on East Asia. And while Japan didn't send troops abroad during the Cold War, or itself become the site of armed conflict, it was intimately involved in all of these wars uh, as, as a staging area. Um, who won, who lost? It's the next question. And we, I think in the United States we like to think we won the Cold War uh, and the Soviet Union lost. I mean, that was certainly the image I was raised up. But I think um, and when we look at the world today, it's becoming clearer and clearer that China won the Cold War. Uh, and then we ask who lost it, and I think one answer we can put out there is that Japan lost the Cold War. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and 1990 happened at exactly the same time that the Japanese economy collapsed. It happened at the same moment that what we call the 1955 system of political rule by the liberal, a single party in Japan, the Liberal Democratic Party, fell apart in 1989, 1990. At, through the 1980s, Japan was the rising superpower. The minute the Cold War ends, Japan falls off a cliff. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't think we know the end of this story yet, but from the perspective where we're sitting now, I think you can make a strong case that Japan lost the Cold War. Uh, when did the Cold War end? I think we have images of the fall of the Berlin Wall, all of these kinds of things. About 1989, 1990, the breakup of the Soviet Union's uh, bloc in Eastern Europe. Th these are all images we have uh, for thinking about when the Cold War ended. But again, when we look at East Asia, and we look at, for instance, the Korean Peninsula today, uh, when we look at the relations between China and its neighbors in, in the South China Sea, when we look at the continuing presence of, of huge U.S. military bases in Okinawa and Japan and Korea, when you look at East Asia, it doesn't really look like the Cold War ever ended. Uh, it looks like we're still pretty much in the Cold War period when we focus on East Asia. When did the Cold War begin? And this is really the question I'd like to focus on in, in, in today's talk. Um, and again, since we're dealing with, a, with an abstract uh, uh, event, not a, a, an event like a war that has a, a defined beginning and an end, a lot of interpretations are possible about when the Cold War began. If we look just at the history of the, the, the phrase Cold War, uh, George Orwell was using the phrase Cold, Orwell, uh, Cold War in essays in 1945 and 1946, so he already was using this phrase. It became in the English language part of our public vocabulary around 1947. Uh, Walter Lippmann published his book, The Cold War, in 1947, and a lot of people point to that as the moment when the idea of the Cold War became widely shared in the English language. If we look in Japanese, it's a little bit later. Uh, if you search, for instance, if you do a keyword search at the Asahi newspaper, one of Japan's most prominent newspapers, for the Japanese equivalent, Leisen, Cold War, the first use is in March 1949. So there's a little delay before the, the, the Japanese word Cold War comes into the public uh, consciousness. Um, but like the Industrial Revolution, I, I think we can say that the Cold War was probably underway before people knew they were in the Cold War. Uh, that, that probably the Cold War started before the, the phrase Cold War was invented. Um, and so when did it start? One date that I've used is August 9th, 1945. 
uh, that was the date of the second atomic bombing in, in Nagasaki. I think you can make a strong case that the Hiroshima, the first atomic bombing, ended World War II. The second atomic bombing started the Cold War, that the audience for the second bombing was really Joseph Stalin. Uh, and we can think of even earlier starting dates uh, for the Cold War. Uh, and the hypothesis that I'm going to throw out uh, at you today is, is that when we rethink the Cold War in terms of East Asia, and in particularly in terms of Japan, we end up with a, a version of the Cold War that looks very different from the one that we're used to, and one that includes a much earlier starting date. Uh, and, and to make my case, I'm going to talk about a very special University of Chicago alumnus, uh, a member of the class of 1913, uh, a man from Kofu, Japan, named Kasai Juji, or as I've said, uh, as he preferred to be called in the United States, George Kasai. I just discovered Kasai about a year ago. I was uh, doing research uh, into anti-communist uh, intellectuals and activists in Japan during the 1950s, and I was reading about Kasai's activities in that period. He was the head of what was called the America-Japan Cultural Society uh, in Japan, and one of my sources mentioned in passing that he was a graduate of the University of Chicago. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, I should go to the library and see what we have. And what I'm going to tell you today is the stuff that I found uh, when I went to the library uh, to figure out who this guy was. Uh, and so as a way of, of rethinking Japanese post-war culture was Cold War culture, I'm going to tell you the story of George Kasai's life. Uh, his connection to the University of Chicago and uh, its connection to the Cold War. But I'm going to tell the story backwards. I'm going to start at the end and work my way back. So let's start at the end. <coughs> I apologize for the, the, the low quality of the images here. This is 1985. On the left, we have Kasai's grave at a cemetery in the outskirts of Tokyo. And on the right, we have a photograph from the funeral for George Kasai. That's U.S. Ambassador Mike Mansfield uh, leaving his funeral in Tokyo in 1985. Let me go back a little bit earlier. This is 1981. Uh, Juji Kasai, George Kasai, age 95, at work at his home, sitting at his typewriter. Let me go back a few more years. Uh, during his lifetime, uh, Kasai published many books and articles, both in English and in Japanese. Uh, his last book was published in 1979. It was in English. It's called Conscience of the Nation, an homage to Senator Hubert H. Humphrey. It's a tribute to Hubert Humphrey shortly after Humphrey died. Uh, and on the right, uh, you probably can't read it, it's a letter from uh, Robert Ingersoll, the former U.S. ambassador to Japan and at the time the vice chairman of the Board of Trustees at the University of Chicago. Uh, it's a personal note to Kasai, uh, thanking him for a remembrance of Hubert Humphrey that Kasai had published in the Japan Times newspaper. Uh, Kasai was a personal friend of Vice President Humphrey. Uh, he had visited him many times at his office in Washington, D.C., and in fact had also visited him at, at his home in Waverly, Minnesota, and once even marched in the Fourth of July parade in Waverly, Minnesota, together with Hubert Humphrey. Um, one of the questions I'll, I'll want to think about is why was Humphrey such an appealing figure to Kasai? Uh, I think I know the answer. I'll return to that a little bit later in the talk. But I think it's pretty impressive. We have this little-known Japanese man uh, who was on really close terms with the former U.S. vice president uh, and uh, presidential candidate. And it, it, I was even more impressed to learn that Kasai had met and knew personally every U.S. president from Theodore Roosevelt to Gerald Ford. Um, Let's go back a little bit further. 1973. Uh, this is an important date in Japan studies at the University of Chicago. In that year, the Japanese government donated a million dollars to the University of Chicago to support Japan's studies. Uh, when the donation was announced, uh, members of the Board of Trustees and the faculty of the University of Chicago went to Tokyo to, for a reception and to thank the Japanese government for this donation. The master of ceremonies at the reception was our friend, uh, George Kasai, uh, pictured here with the chairman of the Board of Trustees, uh, Gaylord T Donnelly, uh, and some local dignitaries and members of the faculty at that 1973 reception in Tokyo. Let's go back a little further. What was Kasai up to in the 1960s? Uh, he was awarded the Order of the Second Treasure, uh, of the Sacred Treasure, Second Class by the Emperor. 
uh, high honor in Japan. And in 1963, he made what turned out to be his final visit to the University of Chicago campus. Uh, he apparently delivered a public lecture uh, during that visit. I haven't been able to find the lecture, so I don't really know what he talked about on that occasion. Um, let's go further back. What was he up to in the 1950s? This is the part of his life that first caught my attention. Uh, his activities in the 1950s as a fiercely anti-communist public intellectual in Japan, as a close friend of General Douglas MacArthur's. Uh, I, I wanted to read you a little bit uh, of, from a letter that he sent to Douglas MacArthur shortly after President Truman fired uh, Douglas MacArthur for ins insubordination. S uh, MacArthur was the uh, Supreme Allied Commander in Japan and Korea and was fired in early 1951. And let me read a little bit of the letter in English that Kasai wrote to his friend Douglas MacArthur. Uh, For the last six years, you have given your life and soul to save the Japanese nation and to upbuild a new democracy. By your noble character and lofty ideals, you have won the hearts of 83 millions of my people to yourself and to your country. For centuries to come, our people will, will remember you as our true friend and benefactor and the savior of our country. President Truman has committed the greatest blunder in American history. Its effect on Japan and Eastern Asia will be very disastrous. He has shaken the Japanese confidence in the United States and helped to advance the Kremlin's interests. He has stabbed in the back the most gallant hero and far-sighted statesman and has crucified him on the cross. Uh, this language is very typical of Kasai's language uh, in, in, in the 1950s. His primary activity in the 1950s was as the head of the America-Japan Cultural Society, whose main activity was every February from 1947 till at least 1959, I'm not sure when it ended, but the last one I have records of is 1959, hosted an, uh, a Lincoln Day celebration in Tokyo. Uh, and when you read Kasai's writings, you never go very far before the name of Abraham Lincoln turns up. Kasai was fascinated by the figure of Lincoln. He collected books, images, and other objects related to Lincoln. And it made me wonder what was it that made Lincoln, in particular, such an object of fascination for Kasai. And I think it's related to the question of why Hubert Humphrey was such an object of fascination. Uh, in, in trying to make sense of this period, one of the books that I found very helpful is, is, is by a, a scholar at the University of California named Christina Klein. It's a book called Cold War Orientalism, and it's a study of I images of East Asia in the United States during the period 1945 to 1961. I, I love the book because it, it helps me understand the world that I grew up in. Uh, I was born in 1961. Maybe like some of you, I grew up in a house where James Missioner's novels were on the bookshelves, where Rogers and Hammer's musicals were on the stereo, popular magazines like Reader's Digest and, and the Saturday Evening Post were sitting on the dining room table. This is the world that I grew up in. Um, and, and Klein shows how these were all instances of middle-brow culture that sought to mobilize individual Americans to take an active role in the vast project that the Cold War was. Uh, these cultural objects worked to make individual Americans into cultural ambassadors, transmitting American values in a people-to-people -people international friendship model. Klein argues uh, that middle-brow culture in the period was dominated by the ideological consensus that we usually call Cold War liberalism. And she says Cold War liberalism has two primary elements, containment and integration. Containment is a pretty uh, common term used when we talk about the Cold War period. It was coined, of course, by George Kennan uh, in his famous 1946 diplomatic cable, and containment became the name of the primary U U.S. strategic doctrine in the Cold War. It was the logic behind conflicts like the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Containment policy saw the world as divided into two broad camps, the free world and the communist bloc, and it sought to prevent, prevent the spread of communism beyond its existing boundaries. Uh, it stressed the unbridgeable difference between the two blocs, and it became a central tenet of anti-communist thought in the United States, Japan, and elsewhere. It was a clear statement containment of what we were against in the Cold War. But there was a troubling problem for Cold War strategists and thinkers. We knew what we were fighting against, but what were we fighting for? What was the name of the thing that we were fighting in favor of? And, and Klein argues that integration is a good name for the, the set of values that became the, the positive side of, 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 of uh, Cold War culture in the United States. Uh, 
In part, this was a, res a response to the Achilles heel uh, of the US in Cold War ideological struggles, the persistence of racism and racist policies in the United States, which around the world were seen as being closely linked to the history of imperialism, and hence were very damaging to US, uh, the, U the US's image uh, around the world during the Cold War. The US wanted to distinguish its own uh, geopolitical position from earlier forms of imperialism. The Soviet Union and its allies could and did often point to discrimination suffered in the US by African Americans and others, and they used it to argue for the superiority of their system and their way of life. So Cold War ideologues in the West knew that this was a dangerous and effective argument and that they had to come up with some counter-argument for it. Integration is the argument that they came up with. Uh, integration as a position strongly rejects essentialist racist categories. It insists that differences among peoples are not biological but cultural. In my own fields, perhaps some of you have read Ruth Benedict's The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, uh, published in 1946. It's a really classic document of this position, insisting that cultural differences are real but they're not biological, they're cultural. Um, integra integration stresses cultural difference argues that cultural differences should be respected, but that they also should be overcome through relationships based on affection, mutual trust, and respect. Uh, integration imagines America's relations with Asia not being based on military or economic power, not being based on imperialism, but rather being based on emotional and sentimental bonds of friendship and intimacy. And, and if we think about things like Rodgers and Hammerstein's musicals like The King and I or, or South Pacific, they're really exemplary of this thought. Cultural difference is celebrated and then overcome through romance, usually. And we see the same pattern in many Hollywood depictions of Japan from this period, like the movie Sayonara, uh, The Tea House of the August Moon, uh, Japanese War Bride, Black Day at, uh, Bad Day at Black Rock, and many others. In these movies, the bad guys are racists who look not on cultural differences. The good guys are heroes who respect cultural differences and then overcome it, usually by falling in love with a Japanese woman. Um, these films and similar cultural products achieve an imaginary integration through emotion, through sentiment, and they represent the values that the U.S. is supposed to be fighting for uh, during the Cold War. So containment stresses boundaries that must not be crossed. Integration stresses boundaries that must be crossed in order to establish the kinds of relationships and bonds that uh, define the, 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 the world that the U.S. wanted to imagine during the Cold War. And so perhaps now we can start to understand why someone like Hubert Humphrey uh, was such an attractive figure for Kasai. Uh, Kasai first met Hubert Humphrey in 1950. Uh, Humphrey was just at that point emerging as a national political figure. Uh, he was famous primarily for two things. The first thing Hubert Humphrey was famous for happened in 1944 and 45. Uh, that was when he was the mayor of Minneapolis. A and the Democratic and the Farmer Labor Parties merged in Minnesota in 1944, 1944 to form the DFL. Uh, the form of the Democratic Party that we still have in Minnesota. Humphrey was crucial in this, and the one thing that he made sure happened in this is that communists were thrown out of the DFL. That the, 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 the radical wing of the Farmer Labor Party, which was a, a leftist party, would not be included in the DFL. That was the first thing Humphrey was famous for. The second thing Humphrey was famous for was, of course, the speech he gave at the 1948 Democratic National Convention uh, as the Democratic Party struggled to figure out what its position was going to be on civil rights. Humphrey de delivered what became an iconic speech in which he declared, my friends, to those who say we are rushing this issue of civil rights, I say to them we are 172 years late. To those who say this civil rights program is an infringement on states' rights, I say this, the time has arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadow of states' rights and walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. I in other words, what I think made Humphrey such an appealing figure to Kasai was that Humphrey contained both strong containment and strong integration, both sides of the equation that were important. And I think that this, this also helps explain Kasai's fascination with Abraham Lincoln, uh, the great emancipator. Uh, in the Lincoln Day celebrations that Kasai organized in Tokyo every year, Lincoln was presented as the primary symbol of American democracy. Lincoln's role as a liberator uh, is stressed. And Kasai repeatedly declares that Lincoln overcame racism to launch the U.S. onto the road to integration. Moreover, Kasai always takes this, this figure of freedom and liberation and, and translates it into being the opposite of the Soviet system, which he always describes as a kind of slavery.
So that the Lincoln that Kasai presents in every year in his Tokyo Lincoln Day celebrations is the perfect embodiment of the formula containment plus integration. Uh, here, for instance, is a letter from Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson that was read, uh, presented to and read to the 1951 Lincoln Day celebration. Let me quote. Lincoln was a world statesman. His concept of freedom and brotherhood recognized no barriers of geography, race, or nationality. We're in the language of integration here. But it goes on. Especially in these days of anxiety concerning the peace of the world, we do well to look to his example of firmness and faith that liberty and justice will prevail over tyranny. We're slipping now into the language of containment. We see this movement between integration and containment repeatedly in Kasai's writings. Here's Kasai's own remarks from the same 1951 Lincoln Day celebration in a speech he gave explaining the meaning of Lincoln Day. And he begins with the language of integration. Lincoln was a frontiersman and essentially American. His love of liberty and freedom and steadfast faith in God led him to fight for the cause of justice and humanity. He abolished slavery and saved the Union and sacrificed his life on the altar of freedom. But as the speech goes on, Kasai starts to switch codes, uh, and this is where he ends up at the end of his speech. Since the Allied occupation, the new constitution was drafted and the dem democratic form of government was established in Japan. But the bulk of our people do not yet understand the true meaning of democracy, as the communists have been making sinister propaganda to confuse liberty with license. While the party politicians have been fighting for their own gain, the Soviet-directed communists have organized their nationwide cell systems with enormous funds. They are doing their utmost to destroy our old heritage as reactionary and are attacking, are attacking American democracy as capitalistic imperialism in order to create anti-American feeling among the people. We end up at the language of containment by the end of the speech. One of my favorite, this is a, a, a congratulatory telegram that was read at the same gathering from a, a, a lawyer in, in Illinois who was a friend of Kasai's. And this is what the lawyer wrote in the telegram. Washington, Lincoln, and MacArthur, the trinity of emancipators. And the greatest of these is MacArthur. <laughs> um, I, I disrupted Regenstein Library the first time I read that because I just burst out laughing as, 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 as you did. Um, let's move back in time. 1950. Uh, in 1950, Juji Kasai uh, became the first Japanese citizen to be given an official exit visa by the U.S. occupation, allowing him to travel overseas. He took the uh, occasion to once again visit the University of Chicago. Uh, he gave a speech. He also traveled down to Springfield uh, to lay a wreath uh, at Lincoln's tombs. Um, let's go back a little bit further. September 10, 1945. Less than a month after Japan's surrender, uh, and only eight days after the U.S. occupation began, newspapers around the United States announced a big scoop. Two reporters from the Associated Press managed to get access to the, to, to the prison where the wartime leader Tojo was being held and interviewed him. Uh, he was being held under charges of being a war criminal. And they interviewed him. They get a, a scoop interview with Tojo eight days after the U.S. occupation ends. And newspapers around the country carry this story. Guess who the interpreter is? Uh, let's go back a little bit further. September 25th, 1941. Kasai visited the University of Chicago again uh, and, among other things, participates in the celebration of the university's 50th anniversary, which happened that autumn. Think about the date. Uh, this is six weeks before Pearl Harbor. Uh, why is Kasai in the United States? Since 1936, he's been a member of Japan's national diet. Uh, he's in the United States as part of a last-ditch diplomatic effort to avoid war between the United States and Japan. Regenstein Library has the original manuscript of the speech uh, that Kasai delivered at, uh, as part of the 50th anniversary celebrations of the universities. The title of his speech was The Basis of Japan's Foreign Policy. When we read the speech, we see that it's the speech of a defeated man. He knows that the war he has tried to prevent between the two countries that he loves is now inevitable. He talks in the speech about a meeting he has just had the previous year with Hitler, Himmler, Goering, and Goebbels in Germany. Uh, and he makes it clear that he strongly opposes the alliance between Japan and Germany. Uh, he doesn't explicitly say why he opposes the Germany-Japan alliance, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's very probable that no Nazi racist policies, which saw non-Aryans, including the Japanese, as being inferior, was probably part of the, his, his thinking. 
Uh, implicitly, I think, it, he's, he's invoking the ideals of integration. Kasai wishes that Japan could avoid an alliance with Germany, but he thinks that recent actions by the U.S., including the abrogation of the Japan-American Commercial Treaty, have opened the door for Germany, allowing Germany to slip in uh, and solidify its military alliance with Japan. And Kasai argues that this is a missed opportunity, that the U.S. and Japan should work together because they have, he's very explicit about this, a common enemy. We shouldn't be fighting the Nazis. We should be working together to be fighting the communists. Uh, and their rising influence in East Asia. The conclusion of his 1941 speech, as you can see from the manuscript here, it's something that he went over and over again, erasing, rewriting. It was something he was trying to get uh, e e exactly right. Uh, this is what he said at the conclusion of the speech. I repeat, Japan and America have no cause for war. There are no questions between the two countries that cannot be settled peacefully. It was 28 years ago that I pleaded here on this same platform, meaning Mandel Hall, for everlasting American-Japanese peace and friendship. Again, as an alumnus of this institution, imbued with its traditions and ideals, and as a member of the House of Representatives of the Imperial Diet, I pray that America and Japan may be friends for centuries to come. May God grant when some future historian shall record the events of this epoch, he shall write that America and Japan acted gloriously, courageously, and with vision in the interests of all humanity. I think we can say that by 1941, Kasai was already using the languages of integration and containment in his speech. And we can trace this back a little bit further. This is from a book he published in 1935 in English. The title of the book is The United States and Japan in the Pacific, American Naval Maneuvers in Japan's Pacific Policy. Uh, like most Japanese public figures of his today, uh, Kasai is a strong defender of Japanese imperial expansion, uh, including the creation of the puppet state Manchukuo, uh, which led to uh, widespread international condemnation and ultimately uh, led Japan to withdraw from the League of Nations in 1933. He supports all of this thi these things because his, his argument in 1935 is that the U.S. and Japan should be natural allies in Asia because they have a common enemy, again communism. And in the book, Kasai clearly uses the language of containment. Japan is creating a buffer to, ex to prevent the expansion of communism uh, into China and Korea. In sum, I think we can argue that in 1935, Juji Kasai is already fighting the Cold War. So when did the Cold War begin? When we put Japan back into the picture of the Cold War and we put the Cold War back into our picture of Japan, I think the shape of things starts to change. We come to see that in dating the beginning of the Cold War from 1947 or 1948, which is I think the dates people usually use based on events in Europe, we're being deceived uh, by Stalin's decision in 1941 to join the Allies after Hitler uh, violated the 1939 Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and invaded the Soviet Union. In other words, the period between 1941 and 1945, when the Soviet Union was an ally of the U.S. and the other uh, Western liberal democracies, was really a blip in history. Uh, and it shouldn't lead us to think that the Cold War only started in 1947 or 1948. When we look at, at Japan and we look at figures like Kasai, it becomes clear we should think of the Cold War as covering a much longer period, as having started well before 1945. Let me move back in time again. The date is June 6, 1913. The place is Mandel Hall, the University of Chicago. A few days before his graduation, Juji Kasai enters into an oratory contest. Before a packed audience in Mandel Hall, he delivers an address entitled The Mastery of the Pacific. And uh, there are several other entries, but in the end, Kasai is awarded the Julius Rosenwald Prize for Excellence in Oratory. Uh, this creates a nationwide sensation. It's widely reported in the press around the country. The Carnegie Endowment sends Kasai on a national speaking tour to repeat the speech in cities around the country. Um, the University of Chicago publishes the speech as a book, and I've actually brought with me tonight the copy of the book uh, that Kasai himself donated uh, to the University of Chicago Library uh, and, and, and uh, dedicated to my alma mater a tribute of loyalty and affection, J. Juji Kasai, Kofu Japan. Um, on the, uh, the speech was an, an, an impassioned plea against the anti-Japanese exclusion movement. 
that was gaining steam at the time, particularly on the West Coast. The speech is a stinging attack on racial prejudice and bigotry and a call for America to live up to its own ideals of equality and justice. In other words, Kasai is preaching the ideals of integration as early as 1913. This is the, uh, f uh, the conclusion of the speech. You, whose brave forefathers fought at Bunker Hill and Gettysburg for the sake of liberty and equality, you who have always stood for the sacred cause of human rights, surely you will not deny us fair play and justice. To you, teachers, students, and friends of this great American university, the leaders of thought, the makers of sound public opinion, the strong bulwark of your great nation, I beg that you summon all your powers to put a stop to this nonsensical war talk and to put an end to petty prejudice born of ignorance and bigotry. Thus, let us not be enemies, but friends. This speech, which, as, as I've said, was a celebrated, became a celebrated instance of, uh, in, in 1913, uh, happened, as, as I said at the beginning, June 6, 1913, which means that this past summer we saw the 100th anniversary of, of Juji Kasai's uh, winning of the Rosenwald Prize for Excellence in Oratory. And uh, I and my colleagues at this, the Center for East Asian Studies, um, realizing the importance of this anniversary, have decided to, to set up uh, another fellowship here at the University of Chicago. Uh, starting this year, we will every year be awarding the George, uh, the Juji George Kasai Class of 1913 Fellowship for Undergraduate Research in Japan, which will support summer research uh, in Japan by advanced University of Chicago undergraduates. We think that this is a, a, an appropriate way to honor the remarkable life and career of uh, George uh, Kasai and his lifelong commitment to Japanese-American friendship and to the University of Chicago. So I will stop here and be happy to answer any questions or uh, hear comments that you may have. Thank you. Yeah, he came from Kofu. He was uh, uh, not the, the eldest son. If he was the eldest son, he probably never would have come to America because uh, the eldest son would have inherited the family. Uh, his, his father was a merchant. Um, and he, uh, he actually came to the United States when he was about 15 and went to Seattle first uh, and graduated from high school in Seattle. He came by himself uh, under, with nobody else from his family. Uh, and while in Seattle, he won a declamation contest. He did Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech uh, and won the, the first prize. The first prize was a trip to the White House to meet the president. Uh, and it was Theodore Roosevelt. And so that was the first U.S. president he met actually before he came to the University of Chicago. Uh, and Roosevelt, um, he, so he delivered the, the Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech at the White House. And as thanks for him, Theodore Roosevelt gave him a biography of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and that was, I think, the beginning of Kasai's fascination with, with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, I have not found any, and he was really uh, he was a completely forgotten figure. Um, you know, as I said, I just stumbled on him about a year ago uh, and have been sort of digging through, trying to find things. Uh, we have located uh, a niece of his who lives in Texas now, uh, but it's been very hard. He, he died in, in the 1980s. Um, his, his, his the, the organization that he set up it's, it has a different name now, but it still exists in Tokyo today. I gave this same uh, talk to the, the um, University of Chicago Alumni Club in Tokyo this past May, and talking with people there, there were some people who'd been around for a long time who remember him. Uh, he was active in the alumni, he was president of the Alumni Club in the 1970s. They had no idea who he was, what his life, they remember him as this, this cute old man who used to come you know, to, to the alumni associations and really had no sense of, of what his life had been and background. So they were really stunned uh, to hear this, this life story. But uh, you know, I'm still excavating him. There may be recordings of him, but we, we have not located them. So. As, as you can guess from his um, uh, in, incredible love of Douglas MacArthur, uh, he thought it was the best thing that had ever happened to Japan. Uh, his one complaint about U.S. policy, including the, the Constitution, is that the U.S. is being a little too easy on the communists in Japan. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that happened in, 
1945, one of the first things the occupation did was there, there were a number of, of leftists, communists, anarchists, and others who'd spent the entire wartime period in jail uh, for their opposition to the Japanese government policies. The U.S. government ordered them released, uh, and in the early years of the occupation, there was actually pretty close co cooperation between the occupation authority and the, the, the Communist Party in Japan and the Socialist Party in Japan, because they were both opposed to the fascist regime. Uh, but so, so Kasai was, you know, didn't like that part of what the U.S. was doing, and he thought that the U.S. wasn't being aggressive enough in later years in countering uh, Soviet and communist activities in, in Japan. So he loved the Japanese Constitution, and, and, and again thought it was the bringing of democracy to Japan. You know, the, the things that have become controversial. Yeah, I. I've never seen him co comment specifically on those, and those didn't really become controversial until a little bit later. They were accepted, I mean, the, 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 the peace clause really became, started becoming controversial about 1960 uh, in, in Japan with the renewal of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty uh, and, and for that period on. And that's kind of the, the moment that Kasai starts fading. I, I, we don't have a, as many public statements from him after that. Um, he might have had some interesting ideas, but I haven't found any. Uh, at this point. Yeah, he was a member in, uh, he was both before the war and after the war, actually. He served in the Diet. Uh, he was elected to one term in 1946 uh, as well. He served in the 30s uh, from Tokyo. Um, I, you know, he, he, the only parties that were allowed to serve were, were to the right of the political spectrum. He was sort of a centrist, in, in, probably within that spectrum. Um, he was basically not allowed to run for re-election after Pearl Harbor. Uh, the last uh, parliamentary election in Japan uh, was in 1942, and it was heavily controlled who was allowed to. The war was on, and, and he was considered to be too close to the United States. His activities, in fact, when he returned to Japan after giving that speech here in September 1941, he was actually brought in for questioning by the police for one night for perhaps being too pro-American. Uh, so he became, uh, this became a, during the wartime period, it, it, it prohibited him from, from functioning as a politician in Japan. Uh, he did serve as, 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 as an official in, in the Japanese government through the war, um, so he wasn't in jail or anything like that, but, but he, uh, his connections with the United States made him too suspicious. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and before the war, mm -hmm. before the uh, situation in mm -hmm. He was, he was absolutely in favor of Japanese expansionism. He, I mean, his, his, he's, he's very clear about this. He thinks the U.S. and Japan, we should divide up Asia. We're the natural rulers of Asia. And if we don't do it, the communists are going to come in. And in a certain sense, he was right. Uh, but what, what he's really, I think, you know, in 1935, in, in that book, which we have in the library, if you want to read it, it's in English. He's, he's very explicit about this, and, and he's really, I think, again, imagining the Cold War order where it's going to be the U.S.-Japan alliance is going to be the main bloc confronting the communists in East Asia. He's, he's already figured this out in 1935, um, but he thinks that the United States you know, should accept Japanese expansion. He thinks that it's in the natural interest of the United States and Japan. So. I believe, um, you know, and I don't have all the details of how he met every president, but I believe it was on the 1950 trip. Uh, that, that he met uh, Truman. Uh, Gerald Ford, he met when he visited Japan in the 70s. Like the yeah, um, I think it was before the firing of MacArthur. Um, yeah, it would be hard to imagine him yeah. wanting to meet Truman after the firing of, 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 of MacArthur. So I think it was probably on the 1950 visit to the United States. But I don't, I, I have him describing this fact that he's met every U.S. president, but I don't have all the details of, 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 of how he met all of them. Some of them I know, but. Mm -hmm. No, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, this is how the Japanese government justifies its position. This is, uh, it's a pretty standard. He's, he's, he's very much in the mainstream on this issue in Japan, thinking that Japanese expansion is not only justified, but natural and inevitable. Uh, and, and, and a little bit mystified that the rest of the world just doesn't get it. Uh, why Japan shouldn't be. And, and again, there's a, you know, all the countries in Europe were expanding. Uh, they weren't shy about expanding. Uh, he, he's pointing out clearly some hypocrisy on the side of, of, of the Western powers and the United States who weren't shy about expanding and putting together their own empires. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very much a mainstream position in Japan at the time. So, yeah, it, it was uh, in the 20s and 
The, the Japanese Communist Party is founded in 1921. There were earlier s socialist parties, labor parties, things like that. Um, through the 20s, it, it, it really, particularly among elite young intellectuals, um, you can't, as in much of the world, the 1920s, the Soviet Union is such a fascinating experience. They're looking around, seeing capitalism fail uh, around them with the Depression and, and, and society seeming to fall apart. It's a very attractive option. And, and so in the 20s uh, and, and into the early 30s, there's a lot of leftist activism. Uh, when candidates are allowed to run for office, they tend to do pretty well uh, in this period. From about 1927 and 28 on, the state repression of uh, of, of the political left becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And by about 1931, 32, it's pretty much impossible to publicly espouse any kind of Marxist uh, position in Japan. There's still a lot of Marxists around, but you can't publicly espouse it. Um, and as I said, um, uh, th th so that's sort of the situation in the 20s and 30s. There are a, a number of Marxists. We have a phenomenon in, that's, that's um, one of the, the central cultural tropes of, of 1930s Japan called Tenko, or political conversion. What happens to a lot of Marxist intellectuals is they're arrested, they're put in jail, and they're told, we'll let you go if you renounce Marxism. Uh, and almost all of them do. Um, some of them are in jail for a year or two. Uh, but the deal is, if, you, you know, if, you'll, if you'll behave and publicly renounce Marxism and say that you'll have nothing to do with it, uh, you, you, we'll let you go home. Um, and most uh, people choose this. I mean, uh, some of them have been polit physically tortured. There are all sorts of reasons why people do this. Um, but there's a group of about 20 who refuse uh, to compromise and spend basically from 1932 or 33 to 1945 in jail under the worst circumstances. When they are released uh, by the U.S. occupation in 1945, they're not surprisingly, they're heroes. They're public heroes, and, and there's a huge swelling of support for the Japan Communist Party as, uh, in 45, 46, 47 as one of the few institutions in Japan that never compromised, that fought the evil fascist regime all the way through. And the communists and the socialists do very well in elections in, in the early post-war period. Um, and even today, one of the interesting things about Japan today, Japan is, is one of the few countries in the world that still has a functioning communist party. Uh, and uh, again, it, it has the image, and, and there are regularly, they poll, it, you know, depends on the election, somewhere between 3 and 5 percent of the vote. Uh, and um, there's an interesting, I, I read an interesting interview with, um, uh, about 10 years ago, with the leader of the Communist Party, uh, when he was saying, you know, we know we would get a lot more votes if we changed the name of the party <laughs> to something else. And yet, one of the reasons people support us is because we're not the kind of political party that changes its name, uh, that there's an integrity or honesty to what we do uh, that's reflected in the name. So it's been a, a, a constant presence uh, throughout uh, uh, Japanese intellectual and political life. Yeah, there were from about the eighth, you know, the first sort of public um, war rumors that start between the U.S. and Japan start in the 1890s. Uh, and there's a, a, a series of flare-ups through the early years of the 20th century of people, as Japan is building up its navy, as the U.S. is building up its navy, uh, th there's a series of rumors. Uh, and then you have sort of the Japanese exclusion, the anti-Japanese movement in California, which feeds the, 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 the fires of this. Um, and it, it's, it's over places, you know, the U.S. is, uh, you know, the 1890s takes Hawaii. Well, Japan had its eyes on Hawaii. Uh, the U.S. in the late 1890s takes the Philippines. Japan had its eyes on the Philippines. They're looking at the territories in the Pacific that haven't been included in an empire, and everyone can see that at some point the U.S. and Japan are going to come to blows as they fight over who's going to control these territories. Um, so there were, from, I would say, from about 1895 to about you know, into the 1920s, well, and obviously into the 1930s and 40s, there's a constant sense that war between the U.S. and Japan is coming. Uh, at some point, and it flares up more at, at some moments and, and, and dies down a little bit at other moments, but it's always there throughout the period. Yeah, I, I think, A, there was the notion that a Japanese citizen had graduated from the University of Chicago. That was pretty rare, although, as I, I said at the beginning of my talk, uh, you know, he wasn't the only one that was here early in the early days. Um, I think that there's the eloquence of the speech in English. Uh, 
if I, I'd encourage you to read it. You can find this. Uh, it's called The Mastery of the Pacific, and it's been digitized, and you can find it on places like archive.org and places like that online. You can read the speech yourself. Um, it's a very well written, impassioned speech. Uh, you know, I think that that had an electrifying effect. He was he was young, handsome, uh, passionate speaker. I think that had something to do with it. And I think that you know that the message he was delivering, both for people who were in favor of it and people who were who were uh, opposed to the message, was really a charged message. It, you know, it was it was a, it was a, uh, you know a very powerful anti-racist speech. Uh, and you know, whatever, wherever you were on the political spectrum, that electrified people. I think those are some of the reasons. Well, you, you know, it's interesting. We, we think of Japan as a homogenous society, but that's really a, a cold. Uh, that's really a Cold War idea. Um, Japan, before 1945, was and perceived itself as a multi-ethnic. Uh, uh, I mean, it was an empire. Uh, it had Koreans. It had Taiwanese. It had uh, people from Okinawa. It wasn't and didn't perceive of itself as, 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 as a uh, homogenous society at that point. Uh, so it had to have ideas about integration uh, there. In, in the Cold War period, part of the process of processing um, its problematic past is to stress the homogenous nature of, of Japanese society, which sort of erases from history all of those connections that it had uh, before 1945. Um, and, you know, it would be interesting, I, I'm trying to think in, in Kasai's post, I mean, so before the war, he really thinks, you know, the, Japan is a big family with lots of different relatives involved, you know, in it and, and isn't, um, you know, as, as, as someone, as, an, as a, an advocate of imperial expansion, you can't stress a homogenous society, that doesn't work. Um, but but I, I, I'll have to look at his writings again and see how he parses this issue regarding Japan after 1945. My guess is he does go the homogenous society line because that is what's consistent with what he's, he's trying to argue. So, thank you. Yeah, and so this, this moment, um, you know, in, in, in that moment of August 15, 1945 in Japan, you know, every social institution, every figure of authority has been rejected. I mean, this complete social and cultural failure uh, and there's this, this, you know, realization among most Japanese that something dramatic has to change. We've been on the wrong course up until now. Uh, and, and, and in that moment, so, so where is the model going to come from? And one possibility is, of course, the Soviet Union, uh, which is why the Communist Party is extremely uh, active in this period. But the other model is the United States. And in a certain sense, come, you know, August 15th, 1945, Juji Kasai's moment arises. You know, here's the Japanese figure, uh, educated, raised in the United States, a lover of the United States, an advocate all along of U.S.-Japan friendship. His moment has arrived, on, and riding in on the white shining horse is Douglas MacArthur, the man that's going to make it work. And he really, I think, perceives himself as, as being the Japanese counterpart, or a Japanese counterpart to Douglas MacArthur, trying to, 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 make, to really realize uh, U.S.-Japan friendship. But this, you know, for a lot of Japanese, we sort of look at this period and think of it suspiciously that, you know, people suddenly, it was really convenient in 1945 to like the United States. But this is what Kasai had been doing, you know, for 30 years at that point. It wasn't for him a new line at all. It's actually uh, part of his life's work. So. Well, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much uh, for coming and for listening, and I hope you have uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your day.